thank you very much for the kind introduction. Happy birthday, Ella. <laughs> uh, let me share with you, maybe I will continue the history telling that uh, Seda started when I came to Santa Barbara. I actually was surprised and, and impressed uh, that I got the offer to go there because I was part of the, let's say, Gaussian distribution of states army <laughs> going to hell, to, <laughs> to the hell of band structure. And uh, it, uh, it's a great pleasure to see people like Hush today again, uh, people with whom I have been discussing a lot on the conferences and uh, heavily debating on the issue of the exciton binding energy and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that Ellen uh, gave this uh, presentation this morning and uh, has told us that the story is not yet over. So maybe hush for you, it's time to go back into science and uh, we... <laughs> Anyhow, so I, uh, I, I somehow decided uh, to work on something different in Santa Barbara. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I started, maybe together with Santa Barbara, is the story of organic lasers. And uh, that's a story uh, I would like uh, to share with you a little bit. And if, because Ellen is not there, I will skip this for a moment and maybe come back to this uh, later. Organic semiconductor lasers. And this is also a story where I learned a lot from from Santa Barbara, where I learned a lot from uh, Ellen, uh, in the sense, uh, what do you do with a scientific uh, discovery? Recent, very recent, uh, or before I went to Santa Barbara, we did this observation of simulated emission in conjugated polymers. This was back in, whatever, 1995, I guess. So um, very uh, shortly, briefly before I uh, went to Santa Barbara and then of course um, everybody, the whole community was excited about the possibility to realize organic semiconductor lasers. And we actually discussed this uh, topic a lot in my old group in Marburg and we had brainstormings and I was actually a member uh, as a PhD student, I was a member of an institute which uh, was mainly working on 3.5 semiconductors and 3.5 semiconductor lasers and uh, we have been discussing there a lot and the main uh, result of the discussions was always, and this was, at least this was my, uh, let's say, my, my take-home lessons that I took from there is uh, that the, always the result of a German discussion is that there are hundreds of uh, reasons why it will not work. So my bosses, uh, the postdocs, everybody was convinced you will never get an organic semiconductor to lace. So I gave up. I was a young PhD student. And then I came to Santa Barbara, and in Santa Barbara, I met people like Ellen, but also uh, great uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs who were working on it and, the actu and who actually got it to lace. And I uh, certainly got one lesson from that. Uh, don't think too much about why it will not work. Just do it. Just go into the lab and do the experiment. And uh, this is then indeed uh, something uh, that I, I, I took took home from Santa Barbara. And one of the stories uh, that I have been working on over the last 20 years is indeed the story of organic semiconductor lasers. Uh, that is a paper that came out uh, from Santa Barbara from that time, from Fumitumo Hebe, Maria, Benjamin Schwartz, Mats Anderson, Kyung Pai, and uh, Ellen, great science paper, which was showing that semiconducting polymers are indeed very nice materials for lasing. We then somehow competed and uh, that story then launched me in Munich into that uh, business of organic semiconductor devices or maybe advanced devices. And uh, this was the idea, uh, let's take these organic semiconductor materials and let's uh, combine them with a nanostructure and let's get them to lace, let's fabricate uh, polymer distributed feedback lasers. And that is something that uh, we have been doing pretty much at the same time as uh, Alan with his team was doing that. Well, just as a brief introduction, what are distributed feedback lasers? Distributed feedback lasers rely on a waveguide, uh, on a, a material that shows optical gain, which is uh, on top of a structure which gives Bragg diffraction, optical Bragg diffraction, which basically 
uh, gives uh, optical feedback, and that means uh, your right uh, propagating wave is coupled to the left propagating wave, and that means you get a standing wave here because of the periodic nano pattern, which is below here. Uh, you can use glass for that, you can use silicon dioxide for that, you can use also polymers uh, for that. And then that means you have that gain material, which is in intimate contact with that nanostructure, and this gives you the standing wave, and together with the gain, you get lasing. And indeed, uh, you get uh, pretty nice laser spectra, so this is from the early times uh, in Munich. Uh, you can see here, with very moderate uh, pumping thresholds, uh, you get this uh, very nice uh, lasing that comes out of the first vibronic sideband of these conjugated uh, polymers which show uh, strong uh, spontaneous emission and then the stimulated emission is there where the absorption is very low and in combination with the nanostructure you indeed get lasing here. So that was good news and uh, what I would like to do with the following couple of slides is just to basically report what has happened since then. Uh, over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, one uh, important uh, step forward from my point of view was uh, to switch from uh, one-dimensional gratings to two-dimensional gratings, basically call what, uh, or use what people usually call photonic crystals. So these two-dimensional egg carton-like structures are very nice uh, two-dimensional uh, photonic structures and they not only give distributed feedback in one direction, but also in, uh, in the second direction. That means you're basically getting an optical standing wave, uh, which is two-dimensional, but which is nevertheless uh, standing and in terms of photonic crystals localized uh, at the gamma point of uh, the band structure. The good point uh, in terms of application is uh, that uh, the far field emission that you get from these lasers is not fan-like, but it's really a beam as it is shown here. This is a far field um, emission that is um, emitted from these 2D lasers right above threshold and you see that this is more or less diffraction limited. If you pump harder, you get a picture that René Janssen is sharing with us every what? Every month uh, on organic electronics. Uh, so this is also an emission pattern that you get when you pump these uh, photonic crystal lasers harder. You get this nice uh, blue emission from LPPP. It's still on the cover, right? So I'm still waiting for the royalties. Uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> One euro per cover sounds like a good deal. Anyhow, good, uh, good pictures uh, and also very nice um, underlying Photophysics in there. Now, continuing uh, my career, I went from uh, Munich to Karlsruhe, and uh, one of the things which is very well developed in Karlsruhe is uh, the micro and nanostructure fabrication. And uh, we spend a lot of time in these in possibilities to do large area replication, micro replication, nano replication, nano imprint, uh, hot embossing, and these issues. And this is just a series of experiments uh, that or a series of technology steps uh, that uh, can be done in order to realize these organic semiconductor lasers. So you basically take a tool, that tool is replicated into a stamp by electroplating, and then that stamp, uh, for example, made uh, from nickel, uh, can be used uh, for hot embossing, imprinting, for example, into a PMMA. And then these passive nanostructures uh, can be coated with the organic semiconductor either by solution processing or by evaporation. Evaporation is uh, one way to deposit LQ3 DCM, which turned out to be a very stable laser material. And here we go, uh, here uh, the laser is done. We worked on that. We worked on uh, further development of uh, the resonators. And uh, one of the resonators which um, pushed us uh, uh, quite a, a qualitative step uh, farer was this one here, which is a combination of first order distributed feedback, which means uh, the period is lambda over two, with a second order distributed feedback, which means that the period is uh, lambda. And that means you can basically control the outcoupling of the lasers uh, just by uh, varying the ratio between the first order and the second order nano patterns uh, that you are using. So basically, these are only uh, working as uh, mirrors, while this one is working as a mirror as well. It is working as an outcoupling structure and thereby directing the beam or the laser emission perpendicular to the substrate. So that one was nice uh, to reduce the threshold. And uh, indeed, one of the things uh, that we could realize uh, with these structures was um, pumping these organic semiconductor lasers not with a 
half a million femtosecond amplif amplifier system, but uh, with a couple of euro laser diodes. So these are basically laser diodes which are now all over the planet uh, in PlayStations, uh, in uh, DVD uh, players. You can basically use these um, violet laser diodes to pump these organic semiconductor lasers. And here we go, uh, you get uh, an organic laser that is more or less uh, tunable by using different materials uh, all the way uh, through the visible spectrum. Now, tunability was uh, the next step, and uh, one very elegant way uh, to realize uh, tunability of these organic semiconductor lasers is indeed you play with a waveguide. Uh, you might remember if you look at uh, the feedback wavelengths in such a waveguide, it uh, depends on the effective refractive index of the waveguided mode. And that one basically depends on the thickness of the waveguide. And that means you can pretty easily tune these organic semiconductor lasers by depositing either by evaporation or also by solution processing a wedge shape uh, layer onto the nanostructure, which gives you a distributed feedback laser which has a different thickness at the waveguide. And that now means you can play around with a pumping spot position and you can basically uh, actively tune mechanically these lasers. And indeed, that uh, was for us a starting point to be, yeah, to become also entrepreneurs, uh, to, to, to develop my, what Alan calls in his book, the California disease. Uh, so I was uh, heavily infected also by that idea to make money with organic semiconductors. And uh, our first attempt to make money uh, with these organic semiconductors in Germany was indeed to commercialize a system which has these organic semiconductor lasers uh, on a disk. And the, the, the interesting or tricky part here is that now uh, by a motor which is uh, completely synchronized with the laser diode which is pumped, you can basically select the position on that rotating disk where you pump and that means you can digitally control the wavelengths uh, of your laser. And as you can see here, that really works. So you can basically digitally control, digitally tune rapidly on a kilo, kilohertz uh, uh, frequency scale, uh, you can uh, tune these lasers. So that uh, started a company which we called uh, Visolas from the visible, visible, so nice box here. Maybe a little bit over-engineered, typical German good old engineering style here. Rock solid, but not enough customers, I would say. So we are currently pushing that uh, further in terms of um, integration. So we basically merged uh, with a company which is called LabNet Systems uh, GmbH. And uh, what we are currently pushing forward is indeed that uh, integrated idea of having these organic semiconductor lasers as tunable sources uh, in such integrated photometric uh, modules for biomedical applications. Now, what else could you do with uh, these lasers um, um, beyond uh, photometry? And that uh, is, of course, a more, let's say, advanced uh, method of analytics, and that is Raman spectroscopy. I will not go into all the details here, uh, but uh, the idea that we have been uh, pushing forward uh, over the last years is basically the following, that we integrate these organic uh, distributed feedback lasers with microfluidics, so basically come up with an optofluidic system where we have uh, an organic photodiode potentially, but also where we have passive uh, optics here to guide the light into the microfluidics, and where we then do in the microfluidic channel fluorescence testing, but also, and that is what I would like to share with you, but also uh, Raman spectroscopy. And in order to do so, we developed uh, quite a bit further that idea of taking a microfluidic uh, chip and then do additive manufacturing of the additional components. Additi additive manufacturing means you basically need a method uh, where you digitally print both the nanostructures that you need for the Raman spectroscopy as well as the lasers uh, that you need as a light source, and indeed that works. I will not uh, share all the details with you. This is basically the method that we are using here. Uh, we are using inkjet printing uh, for the deposition of uh, the organic semiconductors on top of the nanostructures, and the nanostructures before are prepared by a method that uh, you 
could also call printing, but it has not that much to do with printing. It's laser-assisted hot embossing. What we basically do is uh, we have our, our master or our stamp here, and then we locally heat that up, and we do not uh, conventional hot embossing. We come with a laser beam, and uh, we locally, as it is shown here, we locally heat up uh, the stamp and the sample exactly where we need it, and that is a method that can be used both for the realization of the resonator as well as for the realization of the nanostructures that you need for SERS. SERS, surface enhanced Raman scattering, as you all know, is something that relies on plasmonic enhancement. And one very elegant way uh, to realize thousands and thousands of uh, reproducible plasmonic enhancement uh, structures is to use nanopillars made in a polymer COC area and then do sputtering on top uh, with a very thin gold layer. And that means you get basically these uh, nanopillars which are overcoated by gold and you get, I'm not sure whether I can, yeah, so you can see it in here, you get uh, millions of hotspots uh, in between these nanopillars uh, which are there. And once again, these are nanostructures which are low cost, which are made in seconds and which are more or less printed. What can we do with it? Uh, we can measure uh, Raman spectra. So we uh, are currently in the status uh, that we have uh, our conventional Raman setup. We have the printed nanostructures on the one side, the printed lasers on the other side. We have uh, the typical Raman setup uh, instrumentation uh, in between. Uh, however, in any case, we get Raman spectra which are as good as those uh, that we get uh, with a con conventional helium neon laser. And we actually get uh, SERS spectra which are more than a uh, factor of uh, what a couple of hundred better than those uh, that you get with the commercially available clarite substrates, which is shown here. That's good. What is even better, what we are currently working on, is a full integration of all that. Uh, so we, what we are currently developing is uh, the SARS nanostructure here, the organic semiconductor laser here, and then also the passive optics in between, such that we don't need uh, the uh, microscope, the Raman microscope uh, in between, and such that we potentially have something that can be fabricated uh, in very low costs and high volume methods. All right, with this, I uh, want to switch to something that is uh, very related, to be honest. And I don't know how much time do I have. Five minutes should somehow be enough if I'm quick here. Uh, light management, uh, what I would like uh, to show to you is uh, that these number structures that I learned a lot with uh, playing with these organic lasers uh, are also very useful for light management and organic LEDs. And uh, just to update uh, you on, on that, you probably all know that there is a problem with uh, light extraction from organic light emitting diodes. And one way to overcome that is indeed that you use more or less the same nanostructures that we have been using for uh, the organic semiconductor lasers as outcoupling structures uh, in OLEDs. And that is pretty much uh, state of the art of uh, what we have been doing in terms of efficient light management uh, with white uh, LEDs. You can see here the idea. You have that break grading here. That break grading here is uh, now outcoupling the waveguide mode into a direction perpendicular. And now if you see the W here, that means uh, we are talking about the white organic LED. Uh, what you then observe immediately is uh, that you have a grading in here and that you have an angular dispersion. And that means uh, that you basically get a different color into different direction uh, emitted from the organic LED, and that is, of course, not something that you want. And therefore, a good way uh, to compensate for that is uh, to uh, integrate micro lenses, micro lens arrays on the outer part of the substrate, and these micro lens arrays not only scramble the directions of the emitted photons, uh, they also lead to an outcoupling of the substrate mode. The fabrication procedure is uh, as shown here. We start with laser interference lithography. Uh, we then uh, integrate the titania gratings uh, on top of ITO. 
Uh, that is then co overcoated with um, a hole conductor, typically p.psS, and that planarizes that grating here. Nevertheless, that grating is part of the waveguide. We then integrate the organic light emitting uh, structure here, and uh, here we go with the white organic LED. And then uh, the micro lens array is uh, basically realized with a soft embossing uh, step that we have optimized, and that leaves uh, these nice micro lenses on the outer part of the substrates. The results are pretty promising uh, in terms of uh, the efficiency. You can see here basically the, the different factors that we achieved in outcoupling. Uh, we achieve a factor of two outcoupling just by the gratings alone, and then another factor of two outcoupling by the combination of the gratings together with the microlens arrays, and that gives you an overall factor of four. And that means uh, if you start with a rough estimation of 20% of outcoupling, you are ending up uh, at a value of uh, more or less 80% outcoupling of the internally generated light. So far on that, and the last uh, part of my story that I would like to share with you is indeed something that is not yet published, uh, which is somehow combining uh, the idea of microlenses with the idea of nanostructuring uh, the organic LED. And um, the question, of course, is if you have uh, these organic LEDs, how do you get uh, directionality? You have a Lambertian emitter, typically, and that means uh, the organic LEDs are not that useful when it comes to structural illumination. It is not very useful when it comes uh, to applications where you need direct, uh, direct light. Uh, and uh, therefore, we figured out a way uh, to accomplish this, and this is actually a method which is related to what all of Ola did uh, a couple of years ago, but which is uh, different. Uh, and uh, that is that we basically use a self alignment uh, uh, procedure. So these are the micro lenses here, and if we now just do it, uh, we put a, a photo lacquer photoresist on top uh, of uh, the substrate here. This is ITO, this is the polymer, this is flexible over here. Uh, this is ITO, this is now the photo of this. We illuminate uh, through the micro lenses, and by doing so, we basically illuminate uh, just certain spots here, the well defined spots uh, in that photo of this, and then we basically build by evaporation the organic LED on top of that. And that means you have now a pixelated organic LED, which is only active at those spots which you have defined uh, in the self aligning process. Uh, through illumination uh, through the light micro lenses here. And if you do this, indeed, you get, you can actually see this uh, in the photograph here, you get a pretty direct <coughs> light emission. And that is also evident uh, from the measurement here. Of course, uh, we are not in full agreement with the simulation, there is, there is scattering and so on and so on. Nevertheless, we see that the very narrow emission that comes uh, from uh, the organic LED here. And it's not an LED when you think about an OLED, uh, which is where you just have a pinhole. Uh, it's an OLED which is only active at that point uh, in the focus of the micro lens. And this gives you this uh, pretty uh, nice and uh, directed uh, radiation pattern. It actually gives you also a very uh, efficient uh, emission. If you look at um, which current density do you need to get a certain luminance in a certain direction. So this is zero degree here. And as you can see, that's a pixelated organic LED uh, leads, or gives you a much higher luminance for the same uh, current density averaged uh, in terms of medium square square centimeters. So far on that, we not only uh, get a higher luminance, much higher luminance actually, so we get a luminance uh, values meanwhile which are on the order of 1,000 candidates uh, uh, amps uh, with optimized uh, organic LEDs. It also gives you a higher luminous efficacy in the sense that we could enhance, in our case, uh, by 30% from 100 lumen per watt to on the order of 130 lumen per watt. And with that, I'm at the end. I just would like to share with you uh, some visions, some direction for future research, as uh, Serrano was requesting. I'm very happy that Serpil is here, and Gerardo. Gerardo is uh, our group leader of KIT in Innovation Lab in Heidelberg. Uh, he is also part of the family, if you want, so he was uh, in Santa Barbara for a while. I'm very happy that you came to 
KFD Castle in Heidelberg a couple of years ago, and he is running a group in Heidelberg uh, which is dealing uh, with uh, printing. Uh, innovation at Heidelberg is something where we have teamed up uh, with big companies like we have at and Merck, and a couple of universities, so that's the University of Heidelberg and other universities here. And the uh, things that we are doing there are indeed around printing. And I'm pretty convinced uh, that basically all what I have shown to you today in terms of the nanostructures uh, can be integrated also into these road-to-road -road processes that we are all uh, dreaming of uh, when it comes to future organic electronics. So what my vision or my plan for the next no, vision is maybe uh, to work with this, uh, let's say, too far reaching for that, uh, let's say the plans for the next year is certainly to integrate large area printing with nano patterning of the surfaces in order to have high efficiency organic LEDs, low cost uh, high efficiency organic LEDs on the one hand, but also in order to be able to come up with road to road processing of these optophilic, maybe laser based structures that I have discussed. <coughs> Thanks a lot for your attention.